Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hello, I'm Olga Olaker. I'm Hugh Pope. Welcome. Here on War and Peace, we talk about Europe, Russia, the neighborhood that the two of them share, Turkey, and the issues that affect all of these countries. We're going to be paying particular attention to conflict, both in the region and nearby, and the conflicts that these countries get involved in far away. We want to understand how states' policies and actions help or hinder prospects for peace and resolution. But because conflict can't be understood without a broader context, we're also going to be bringing you some thoughts on that context, from politics to society to culture. And today we are very pleased to have with us in the studio our boss, Rob Malley. Rob is the CEO of International Crisis Group. He was also uh, in the Obama administration, one of the negotiators of the Iran deal. Hugh, tell us a little bit about what the Iran deal was. Well, three main points. At core, it was an extraordinarily simple compromise, a way for Iran to have a peaceful nuclear program that was accepted by the world and also a program that was inspected rigorously by recognized agencies. Secondly, the deal was involved the most powerful countries of the world. Iran, the US, China, Russia, UK, France and Germany all signed off on it. And the third thing that's really important is that in May last year, the United States walked out of this deal. Now, this deal was one of the main pathways for the Islamic revolutionary regime in Iran to come into the international community. And now, unfortunately, and it's something we cover a lot of crisis group, is the risk of increasing conflict as the US and Iran's Iranian paths diverge. That's the simple top three things I think that we should know. And um, over to you, Holly. There, there's a lot there. Well, since we're sitting here in Brussels, uh, Rob, I'm going to start with a historical question. What was uh, the role of the European parties to this deal? As you said, all the important countries in the world, only some of them are European. What was the European role? So Europe had uh, two roles. First, as Hugh just said, there were European members of the Security Council and Germany who were part of the negotiations. But you also had the EU that had sort of the overarching coordinating role that was given to it by, by the United Nations Security Council resolution. So the EU has been following this actually even before the U.S. was involved. And so, they, and they played this role, and I have to say, having seen it, they played a critical role of making sure that things were moving, things were moving, even when there were some divisions among the P5 plus one, the Western party plus Russia and China that was negotiating with Iran to make sure that their positions were coordinated. So that's what uh, Federica Mogherini did after Lady Ashton and after Javi Solana. So they played those roles both as, as a negotiating party and as overall coordinator. And now, with the United States having pulled out of the deal, has Europe's role changed? They seem to be the ones trying to hold it together. Right. So they've, they've gone from participant to now uh, trying to save it from collapse. As Hugh said, I mean, what, what, by the U.S. walking away, what really happened was that the, the key element of the bargain was that Iran would both roll back and, in some respects, freeze its nuclear program for a number of years and commit to never developing a nuclear weapon. And in exchange, sanctions, which had been imposed on Iran in order to get to this point. And which were crippling Iran's economy. Which are crippling Iran's economy. And, I mean, there's a whole host of sanctions, but there's some sanctions that were imposed because of its nuclear program. Those were going to be waived, lifted, at least as a test to see how Iran was doing. And then they were going to be formally, fully lifted uh, after the, the certain number of years had expired. What uh, the Trump administration did is that it reimposed its sanctions. Not only did it reimpose the sanctions, but it's really been on a very, very effective campaign to deter other countries from having any kind of economic relations with Iran. So Iran's economy, Iran's oil exports are now even lower than they were prior to Iran entering the deal in the first place. So it has been, I would say, surprisingly effective how the U.S. acting without the support of other countries has been able to deter them, to frighten them. And what uh, Europe is trying to do is to maintain a modicum of commercial relations with Iran on the, on the one hand. Because those U.S. sanctions affect the European countries too. Because it's secondary sanctions. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. is telling any European company, you got a choice. You could go and do business with Iran, which is a pretty small economy, in which case our doors are shut to you, or you could choose us and all you'll lose is the, the Iranian economy. So it doesn't, almost doesn't matter what European countries say. Any business 
except for business that has no relationship whatsoever with the U.S., is going to choose the U.S. market over the Iranian market. So Europe has tried pretty hard, has not really succeeded yet, and now it's trying to invent a new mechanism to help have some trade with Iran, but it doesn't want to alienate the U.S. too much, and that's the dance that the US, EU has and the European countries have been involved in now for about a year. It's a pretty black and white picture between what you and the Obama administration were working for before President Trump came and the picture now. Do you think when you look at it, that it's unsalvageable? Or do you think that there can be a flip-flop back to the Iran deal? You know, I think the worlds are divided between optimists, pessimists, and pessoptimists. And I'm in the <laughs> third category, which is that, you know, objectively, things look pretty bleak because the U.S. seems determined to continue on its maximum pressure campaign. And if you listen to them, and I, part of what we do as crisis group is put ourselves in everyone's shoes, even the most uncomfortable ones. And if you listen to members of the Trump administration, what they say Iran, they say Iran's problem is not just a nuclear problem. It's a nuclear problem. It's a missile problem. It's a regional destabilization problem. It's a terrorism problem. That's how they define it. And they say the problem with the nuclear deal is that it gave, it allowed Iran to put one issue aside, the nuclear issue. In exchange, it was getting money and, as the Trump administration sees it, using that money to finance all the other negative activities in, is engaged in. So they believe you can't have a nuclear deal on its own that doesn't cover other elements. They also argue that the nuclear deal was too short in terms of the length of the time constraints, of the constraints that are being imposed on Iran. So that's their view. If that's their view, it's very hard to see how you get to an agreement because Iran is not about to change its foreign policy, its support for certain groups in the region, its acquisition, uh, development of ballistic missiles at a time when they feel that's the only defense they have. So it does seem a bit like a zero-sum game. The reason I'm not completely pessimistic is number one, Europe does have an independent role to play. They still can carve out some trade, some commerce, which they're trying to do immunized from U.S. sanctions. They're trying to build a wall between small but still significant exchange with Iran that can't be uh, affected by U.S. sanctions. And secondly, because President Macron in, in recent months has been trying to convince President Trump that if he really, what he wants is an agreement with Iran, there's a better way to go about it than what he's done, which is to waive some of the sanctions that have been reimposed to allow Iran's economy to breathe a little bit more in exchange for Iran agreeing to come back to negotiations and to try to negotiate this bigger deal. And so that's why, you know, the, the pessimists would say, and, you know, they, they have a fair point that there's a zero-sum game. The optimists would say, well, the Europe is trying, Europe is going to try to save the deal. They might convince President Trump, who doesn't want a war. And then the, the pessimists that I would, I would put crisis group in that category saying, it looks pretty bleak, but we're, we are going to do everything we can and we're going to work with those who want to save the deal uh, to see if that's possible. You're traveling around the world and you're meeting lots of leading people from all kinds of uh, countries that are directly or peripherally involved. What are the three main points that you make to them about bringing Iran in from the cold rather than pushing it away? What are the key advocacy points you make? So first of all, I'm not, I'm not sure that I put it as putting, taking them, bringing them out from the cold because then people say, well, in order to be out of the, out of the cold, they're going to have to change the entire policy. So that I, think, I think the three arguments are, number one, that the current strategy is not working. By the own criteria that the Trump administration has put forward, the maximum pressure campaign was supposed to do two things. One, it was supposed to get uh, Iran to agree to more stringent nuclear constraints. And second, it was supposed to get Iran to moderate its behavior. And yet, over the past several months, we've seen two things. Iran is now reneging on some of its nuclear commitments, so it's further away from the, from the stringent constraints that the Trump administration wanted, and it has intensified its regional activities. It's taken action against some oil tankers. It's also inflamed, uh, in its own way, the situation in Iraq and Syria. So by what the Trump administration says, its own standards, Iran is behaving more negatively now than before the maximum pressure campaign was imposed. So if argument number one, it's not working. Argument number two is that this risks leading to a much, much more dangerous conflagration in the region. Because Iran's reaction, as I just described it, is to move away from the nuclear deal and intensify some of its regional activities. They're trying to do it in a calibrated way, but we know in this region miscalculations abound. What they think could be calibrated could be viewed by the U.S. or by Israel as being excessive. The U.S. may then react in a way that Iran will de deem excessive, and you could see two countries that don't want to go to war. I'm, I don't think that President Trump or the Iranian leadership want to go to war, but they may be led there because neither one can back down if, if the other one exerts too much pressure. And from the Iranian point of view right now, given what Olya was saying about the economic 
distress that they're under, they may be prepared to take quite a few risks to get out of it, and the risks for them is to show the world as a price to pay for what they consider to be economic warfare. So argument number two, this could lead to regional war of a type that we haven't seen in, in our lifetime, certainly. And argument number three is that there is a better way. If what you really want is to see whether Iran could agree to a longer-term duration of the deal or and start talking about missiles and start talking about its regional behavior, the better way is to implement the deal that was signed, that was reached under the Obama administration, implement it faithfully, all sides, and then build on it. That's the better path. So a current path that's failing, a current path that's dangerous, a better path that we think is available. But is it really available? I mean, do you see the Trump administration going back to a deal they have insisted is not an acceptable deal? So you know those cartoons when people have two voices speaking to them, left ear, right ear, and usually it's the devil and the angel? Um, I'm not going to say who's the devil or the angel in this case, but you do have President Trump who, who has two voices in his head. One voice is his national security advisor, John Bolton, and others, hardline, who say maximum pressure all the way. Iran is going to surrender, Iran is going to have to uh, agree to our terms because the economy can't survive, and maybe other things will happen, maybe there'll be unrest in Iran, maybe the regime will fall. That's one voice that he hears. The other voice he hears is the voice of President Macron and some others who say, President Trump, what you want is a deal. You don't want war. The current path could lead to war that you don't want. The policies that you're implementing could lead precisely to the objective that you say you don't want and that your base doesn't want in the run-up to elections that are going to take place in about 18 months. There's a better way, and that better way is to engage with the Iranians, agree to you know, uh, lift some of the sanctions, get them to come back into compliance with the nuclear deal, and then to sit down for talks. And the struggle right now, in a way, is as much a struggle between Iran and the United States as is a struggle between Trump A and Trump B. And whichever one of those Trumps prevails is going to decide whether we're on the path towards some kind of new deal, more or less, or some kind of uh, perilous war. So what would it take to strengthen the Macron voice? What, what President Macron did, which was smart, is that he, on the first day of the, of the G7 uh, uh, meeting that, that, that took place in France, he insisted on having a one-on-one -on -one with President Trump, knowing that one-on-one -on -one the president will hear that voice and won't have the other voices pushing back. The, the flip side, of course, is that President Trump then will hear the next voice, and he usually acts based on the last thing he heard. So it's not clear that that enough will do. So what you also need are voices in the United States who we're talking to, often Republicans, people who are close to President Trump and who could speak to him about what the base that voted him into office wants. And they, they voted in part, not, certainly not entirely, in part out of fatigue with what they consider to be overinvestment in the Middle East. The one aspect of what Trump said during the campaign that had, you know, that the crisis group might have identified with, which is when he said the Iraq war was a calamitous mistake and we should not repeat that and the U.S. has expended too much treasure, too much resources. We would add and does too much harm to the region because of these military interventions. It's clear that that's his instinct. So he needs to hear that from people in the United States, some, you know, bedfellows that that crisis group may have in terms of agreement on this issue which is that the U.S. is better served by diplomacy than by increased pressure on Iran, which could lead an isolation and sanctions of Iran, which could lead to the confrontation he doesn't want. Just to wrap this, this up, on, on the, uh, you're again talking about the United States as being the key arena where this will be decided. Uh, we quoted in Crisis Group's report an Iranian diplomat who, who said, Europe has the political but not the practical will to stand up to the US. Do you think the, the Europeans are, are somewhat irrelevant then? Well, I certainly don't think they're irrelevant. I think that the point of the quote is it is true that Europe has been walking this fine line between being pretty, on principle, pretty uh, opposed to Trump's President Trump's policies, but in practice, understanding they have to live the, with the United States, they don't want to alienate him too much, particularly at a time when Europe is as divided as it is today. So if Europe were fully united and could stand as one against the United States, it may be one thing, but when you see Brexit and you see Europeans going in different directions and a number of countries in, Euro in the European Union that want to have good relations, better relations with the U.S., who identify, in fact, some of the leaders identify with President Trump's approach to governance, his peculiar brand of politics, populism, nationalism, sometimes xenophobia. I think that division means that it's hard for Europe to stand up and to be as practical in its opposition and in setting up this alternative mechanism that I alluded to that would be immunized from uh, U.S. sanctions and be able to engage in trade with, with Iran. If you had a more united Europe, you could do it. But even without that, I think you're seeing enough. The Europeans, even those who 
like the UK, want to have better relations with the US, they don't want a war in the Middle East. That's their, that's their neighborhood. And so uh, I would certainly not call them irrelevant. I think right now the hope is what Europe does and what voice President Trump hears most loudly. So one European country that hasn't come up here, but which played an important role in this deal is Russia. Uh, and you talked about Trump needing to hear voices within the United States, as well as coming from France and perhaps Germany and the UK. Does it need to hear voices from Russia? Can Russia be valuable here? And is this an area for Russian European cooperation? No, Russia could be valuable. Russia was valuable in the negotiations, first of all. Mm-hmm. And, and people may not know that in, at some key moments, including at the end, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov was the one that Secretary Kerry relied on to put a lot of pressure on the Iranian foreign minister to say, enough is enough, we're going to reach a deal now. And he threatened to leave if and he said, I'm going home if we don't reach it now. So the Russians, I think, wanted the deal. They want the deal to succeed. And there is, again, the special relationship between President Trump and President Putin. I think President Trump likes to work with President Putin if they could have a... And he's a, looking a, for ways to cooperate. Exactly. And this is one place they could do it. There hasn't been much indication of it yet, other than the the Russians saying, we're going to make sure this deal stays alive if we can do it. You know, Russia's policy towards Iran has been, um, it's been mixed. And this is something an Iranian uh, senior diplomat told me years ago when I was working at Crisis Mm -hmm. Group back in the the 2000s. He said, be careful about Russia. Yes, they don't want war with, uh, between the US and Iran. But they also don't want two good relations between those two countries. They want to be the ones who have better relations with the U.S. and better relations with Iran than Iran or the U.S. have with one another. So I'm not sure how far the Russians are prepared to go to try to help Iran and the United States bridge this gap, but they will, they can play a role in at least uh, stop averting the worst outcome, which would be a breakdown and a war breaking out between between those two countries. And I do think if, if President Putin is prepared to work with President Trump to get there, it would, it's an added voice on that side of, the, of, of President Trump's brain. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and we're talking to our CEO, Rob Malley, about the Iran deal, what was and what may yet be. So, Rob, we were talking about a possible Russian role in convincing Trump. Is there an intermediate step where the Russians actually work with the Europeans more coherently? And it kind of it also goes to this question of, are we talking about the Europeans or are we talking about Macron? Are we talking about France or are we talking about a European initiative? President Macron has taken the lead, mm-hmm. but it is, a, as far as I know, it's, it's one that both the UK and Germany and the EU as a whole uh, have endorsed. And yes, Russia could cooperate with the Europeans and without getting into too many technical details. As I said, the, the, the Europeans have set up this alternative mechanism called INSTEX, mm-hmm. which is a barter mechanism, which the, the goal is to allow trade with Iran, oil exports by Iran, and humanitarian and other goods, medicine and food going going to Iran through some kind of barter mechanism. And Russia could participate in that. And that's something that I think is being discussed. So that would add, you know, add more volume to whatever trade is being done. So in that sense, it could be cooperation. There could also be cooperation on another, you know, we've spoken about the need at some point to resolve all of the, the, the conflicts in the region which make this such a combustible one, and uh, Russia has spoken about a new security architecture. The French are interested in the same. They have different conceptions of what it would be, but at some point you could imagine coordination among a greater number of countries to try to see how do we address what is at the root of all of these fears and concerns and, and, and threats, which is divisions between Iran on the one hand and its allies, and the U.S., Saudi Arabia, UAE, and some European countries on the other. And that has to do with how are you going to address not only the regional conflicts, Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Lebanon, but also how are you going to deal with the uh, maritime security, the threat perception that both sides have, the direct confrontation that they fear. And that could be done in a broader in a broader uh, context in which Russia could play a role. I don't think they were there yet. Mm-hmm. That's sort of chapter two. But a chapter that at Crisis Group we're already thinking about because if you want to play the role of conflict preventor, you have to think ahead of time, and that's what we're doing in in coordination with a number of these countries to see whether we could come up with ideas, something, you know, as a Europeanist, you'd understand, uh, analogous to, although different from the Helsinki Accords and sort of what gave rise to the OSCE, can there be a security architecture in the Persian Gulf, at the Gulf, and in the the Middle East more broadly that would address some uh, some of these potential causes of conflict and actual conflicts? Rob, now we're in this, this stage where there's not much hope of progress. And back in 2015 for, or 2014-13, when you started out on this 
process with Iran, it, you know, Iran being a traditional enemy of the United States in American feelings. And uh, how could your memories of that period encourage people now to get back to a more constructive track? I mean, what, what was it that propelled you in those inner discussions when you were in the White House that made you confident that you could really reach a deal with such a, a suspected adversary? I think you know me well enough to know that I was never confident, even until the week before I wasn't sure that, uh, that we'd get the deal. But I think what was animating it, was, was, again, was two things. First, a threat. Let's not forget that in 2013, 12, 13, 14, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, and others were saying, if Iran continues with its nuclear program, there will be war, there will be a military strike. That was very clear, and Prime Minister Netanyahu came to the UN with his chart showing if Iran continues to enrich uranium at a certain level, we will take action. So there was a really very real threat. Israel was talking to the United States to try to convince the US we need to be more uh, robust in our military options. I think, I think President Obama was prepared to go to war if it, if it came to that, but he wanted to do everything possible to avoid it. Second was the opportunity, and I don't want to sound naive, the opportunity that at least I saw was not Iran's going to be transformed, it's going to be a moderate country, everyone's going to be getting along. It was, can we reach one agreement? The first agreement, actually, that the Islamic Republic would have reached with the quote-unquote international community since the revolution in 79, could we change its behavior on one issue? By being realistic, by being concrete about what they would get, what they'd have to give. And that was very much President Obama's point of view. He said, we're dealing with this issue. Here are my red lines. If we get it, here's what we're prepared to give. That was the mandate he gave to, to Secretary Kerry. And it was a very united American team. I mean, that's also part of what was great. There was no real divisions. Everyone was on the same page because the guidance was, was pretty clear. And it was, you know, as you know, Hugh, uh, a view that Crisis Group has had been putting forward since mid-2000s, as far as I recall, about this deal, not a grandiose deal that was going to transform Iran, but a very concrete deal to take care of a very specific problem, and in fact there's a lot of, uh, lot of parallels between what Kreisgru proposed back then and what was, ultimately, uh, what was ultimately agreed to. So I thought when I entered the, the Obama administration, this was the issue that most animated me. I'd worked on it at Crisis Group for 12 years, and I thought this is an opportunity, a president who wants to do it, who has the ability to do it, who has the team, and Secretary Kerry was prepared to travel the world 10 times over in order to get this deal done. Uh, but also working, and this was what made the, the negotiations both uh, difficult but also exciting, working with all those other countries. You know, it wasn't just negotiating with Iran. It was negotiating with the Europeans and the Russians and the Chinese. And not everyone was on the same page. So you had to first make sure you had the Europeans on board, the Russians on board, the Chinese on board. And once you had that common position, then present it to the Iranians. So it was, you know, it was long, it was, it was arduous, but it succeeded for at least as long as it succeeded. I think one could look back at it with... Uh, one can look back at it and say, oh, it's unfortunate, it was, it was for naught. It's not the way I look at it. Let's think of where we'd be today if the Trump administration had come into office and there had been no deal, and Iran had continued to expand its nuclear program. The odds then that we would be at war now would be quite high. So I think at a minimum, what the Obama administration did is show that a deal with Iran is possible if you're realistic about it, if you use sanctions in a smart way not in the way that says sanctions in order to get regime change, but sanctions to change a specific form of behavior. Iran could change its, its, its position, and you could do this in a collective way by working with Europeans and even with Russia and China. It must have been a remarkable moment in, when a week before you began yeah. to believe that it was going to happen. Tell us about that, what it felt like to see that actually be signed. So again, I would say two, two things. About a week before, several days before, was one of the lowest points. The press has reported it. Uh, Foreign Minister Zarif sort of... Uh, exploded at, at, at the deal that was put to him, and he said he had his same as sentence, never threaten an Iranian, which sort of went viral. And it looked at that point like either he was going to leave and it would be the collapse of the talks, or he was doing it as one last show to prove people back home that he was being tough, to get one more concession, and then to move on. And it was the latter. I think clearly the Iranians wanted a deal. We didn't really budge from the position that we had put forward. I mean, by we, I mean the, the P5 plus one. And then once they came back and they started talking specifics about changes they wanted to, to what we had put forward, that's when we knew they want this deal is going to happen. And then it was on July 14th, Bastille Day, the, the deal was reached. Um, even at the last minute, we had to make some last minute changes. Uh, you know, everyone at the last minute wants to add their own piece of indispensable element to the, to the deal. 
but yeah, it felt uh, it was a good moment. As I said, uh, now we have to, we are where we are today. But at least that memory, as you as you put it, you re- should remind us that a deal is possible. As always in the Middle East, until everyone has had a good shout, it's not really a deal. But exactly. um, you're still talking to very senior Iranians. How do they feel about it all? So we talked to everyone. I just came back from Saudi Arabia, so I speak to very senior Saudis. Mm. Uh, obviously, the U.S., we speak to people there. I'm a, in Europe now, and we'll be speaking to European officials. The Iranian officials, I think they've been saying for some time that they could be patient. They could continue to abide by the nuclear agreement, but their patience has limits. And for them, if the economic component, if what they expected as, a, as the quid to the quote or the quote of the quid doesn't come fo- forward, they're going to walk away. And little by little, they have been walking away. They still tell us, if we could stay with the deal, that's our preference. But we cannot take this lying down and not react. Of course, we, I mean, we just share with them our analysis of what could happen if they, if they genuinely, uh, significantly walk away from the deal. We continue to talk to them, as do others. Again, I think they, their preference would be to stay in the deal, but there are limits to how long they can do that if, if the maximum pressure campaign continues. And a lot of this, I mean, what we're really talking about is everybody wants the deal except maybe the United States, right? So it's a question of how do you get... And Israel. Pre- and some Gulf countries. <laughs> you got a few more. <laughs> uh, okay, fair enough. But the, the United States is the country that needs to be brought back in, yes. really. Yes. And it's a question of how a combination of Iranian noncompliance, but only to a certain point, French pressure, Russian pressure on, on the Americans can turn a U.S. administration around. Uh, I'm going to ask a more global question um, beyond the Iran deal. Is this the new world order? Is the new world order a lot of countries pushing back against the Americans? Yes, pushing back, but also trying to appeal to them. Let's not forget Macron's genius, if that's how we want to put it, has been to be quite principled in his opposition to key tenets of, of, of President Trump's agenda, you know, Macron wants to stand as the apostle of multilateralism. But at the same, so he stands up, but he also wants to work with them and, and cooperate and, and dangle in front of Trump the, the possibility that he could be the deal maker. He could be the peacemaker. I, but I do think you're right. We're in a more a la carte kind of world order where there are not so much alliances, but partnerships that form uh, in an ad hoc manner on certain issues. On some issues, as you said, Russia and France may be uh, in agreement, and others, Russia and uh, and the U.S., and others, France and the U.S., and the Europeans would also be a bit more of, a, of that ad hoc quality. I think alliances still remain, but there's a much more fluid uh, quality to them, in large part because of the U.S. Not only are there other global phenomena that have happened, there's more global uh, global power, great power competition, but what President Trump has done is intru- has accelerated that process, and I now you now see countries that are looking around to see who do they have greater alignment with on a specific issue? Rob, thank you so much. This has been such an interesting conversation, and I'm confident our listeners have learned as much, if not more, from it than we have. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It was great uh, to talk to you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you for tuning in to War and Peace. Uh, if you want to better understand the Iran deal and what has happened and is happening in Iran, visit uh, www.crisisgroup.org and check out our Iran page. Huge thanks to Rob Malley for joining us for this conversation. Thank you to Billy Media for producing this podcast. And uh, thank you, our listeners, for tuning in. Goodbye. Goodbye. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.